What's up, guys? This is Derek Kirby, aka DDP, back with another Mavericks video here. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different, something we have not really done much of on this channel. We've never really gone down and broken down film, and there's an obvious reason for that. I don't own the copyright to the footage, and at the very least, I'm getting copyright claims for using it, which means I can't monetize the videos. And in a more extreme sense, the copyright holder could get could go as far as to hit me with a copyright strike. Now, what that means, that's going to basically handcuff the channel. Now, those do eventually drop off, but it could be something where uh, for X amount of time, maybe three months, I have less of my YouTube features available at my disposal. It could be that... I lose the ability to live stream for a while. Like, they don't mess around and they stack. If you get, if you keep adding strikes, I think after three strikes, I don't remember if it's the third strike itself or the one after a third, which also counts as four. Thankfully, or rather hopefully, I'll never have to see what happens with that. But eventually, you do it enough times and YouTube will just delete your channel. Suspend you or delete your channel, whatever. I don't want that to happen. I don't think you want that to happen. So I've always kept distance because even when I was doing the vintage collection for a while, which was me reacting to old Maverick games and playoff games and things of that nature, that was fun to do, but I got copyright claimed on every one of those videos, right? It was either uh, NBA or TNT, whoever had the broadcast rights basically just taking any like if i made 37 cents they were taking it i get it but it is what it is it's always kept me from it i don't intend or expect to make any money on this video i just know that there is a somewhat sizable number of you guys that want me to make more of this content so i will take a crack at it because i feel like to really explain today's topic i have to show you the play now, thankfully, in the copyright issues, that does not apply, far as I've seen, when dealing with post-game. Post-game is considered more wide open, it seems like. There, are, there aren't really broadcast rights issues on that. So, we'll see. But I feel like you need to see the last play itself of the Mavericks-Spurs game. Yes, we're talking about the DeRozan game winner. And we need to talk about what we think happened there because it's a baffling decision that Dallas makes had obviously terrible consequences for that game's final result. And the post game was just weird. And I know we had the 76ers game the very next night. And I actually tried recording this initially yesterday, but I decided I needed to go back and show you guys the footage. I needed to illustrate my point better and I just ran out of time to be able to do it. So we're going to do it today, and we're going to try and analyze what the hell was Rick Carlisle doing in postgame when he gave a statement, left, and then came back to basically reverse field on the previous answer he gave. There's something odd about that. We're going to review it. So first, let's start with and I'm sorry to do this to you. We're going to start with the DeRozan play itself. All right, so here we get Luca's bucket that ties it at 117 all with 19 seconds left. A nice little Euro step into a floater. San Antonio calls a timeout here, and I want to call that out. San Antonio takes a timeout, which means you have a chance to set your defense. The game is tied. DeMar DeRozan is lethal in the mid-range. Lethal. He's not even going to look to take a three. He has killed you in this game. Dallas's decision with 19 seconds left in the Spurs inbounding to not trap him and force the ball out of his hands is baffling. Like, dumbstruck. I'm dumbstruck trying to make sense of this decision or rather lack of decision to do this. Now here's a chance here, right? We got a pick and roll and San Antonio 
as you might expect, is attacking Luca. Luca is on DeRozan. Dorian Finney-Smith is recovering. So what is San Antonio going to look to do? Well, DeRozan, as I said, lethal in the mid-range, and he is going to juice basically every tenth of a second out of this clock, and then he's going to do this. Here's what I want to call attention to. You know what? I'll, I'll call attention to it. First, I'll let you see the play, and then I'll roll it back. Okay, five tenths of a second left. San Antonio's going ahead on this, 119 to 117. Now, what I want you to watch on this play is watch Luca. So he helps okay. He's keeping him in front. Now he's hanging out. He's in help, but he's hanging out in the mid-ground, and he is staring a hole through DeRozan. This is another place where you send pressure. You try to force the ball at any cost. Force the ball out of DeRozan's hands and force someone else to beat you because DeRozan is an assassin in this exact scenario. Instead, Luca kind of hangs out and watches. And yeah, he goes to crash the board, but that's, that's it. He missed an opportunity to double. Now, here's where things get even stranger. All right, now this is Mavericks coach Rick Carlisle in the postgame in his first of two sessions, I guess you would say. He sits down. He gives a regular length explanation. He leaves, and then a few minutes later, he returns with another statement. Now, this question regarding DeRozan's game winner comes from, no surprise, ESPN's Tim McMahon. I'm going to turn the volume up a little bit because I want you to be able to hear everything. Hey, Ray, uh, DeRozan obviously had it going. They hit the big shot there at the end. What was the thought process behind not sending the devil at him and trying to get the ball out of his hands on that possession? Yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to... Uh... It's something that we, we talked about doing. We talked about doing it in the, in the timeout. Uh, I'm going to have to get more specific on, ex on exactly um, what our triggers were on that. Uh, obviously, we should have gone, um, and that's, that's on me. But we had, uh, we had talked about doing it. Um, I'll have to look at it, and I can give you a better answer tomorrow. All right, now we're going to pick up here in a moment, and you'll see this edit cut. It's the same post-game show, it's just from a different perspective, so don't worry about that. But you'll see the kind of flash edit cut they use for when Rick came back after wrapping up his initial post-game to clarify something. Uh, you know, he's a guy that's, that's going to help us down the stretch of the season. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just to, to clarify on the, on the DeRozan last shot, uh, we talked about the possibility of, of going, but we... Elected not to. We elected to let, let Dodo guard him uh, straight up. In hindsight, we obviously should have gone that, and that's that's on me. That's my that's my decision. So um, that's a that's a uh, a detailed description of it. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. So what do we take away from this? Well, the Mavericks, as I said, should have double teamed, and Rick Carlisle seems to suggest in the initial post game presser that. Yes, we talked about doing that in the timeout, and I'm going to have to see the word, the phrase he uses is what triggers occurred. Basically, there are certain scenarios that they're looking for where, hey, if he goes to the middle, if he goes right and, you know, towards the middle, then the next man is supposed to collapse down, something like that. He, he's basically saying, like, you don't necessarily just do it no matter what. You have certain scenarios in which you do it, depending on what the offensive player, in this case, DeRozan, does so he's saying all right i'm gonna have to look before i can give you a great answer on that but we should have clearly done that and i'm gonna have to look to see why that assignment was missed basically he leaves he comes back a few minutes later and goes into this whole thing again like to clarify we didn't make that decision. We basically, we talked about it. Yeah, yeah, I know I already said we talked about it. So we talked about it, but we, you know, we ultimately decided to 
have Dorian take him one-on-one, -on -one, and that's what we were going to do. Why would Rick Carlisle say that? You know, in both instances, he says, you know, that's on me. I get it. Carlisle does that. That's what a good coach would do. You assume that responsibility every time, regardless, because you're protecting your superstar. You don't want to look like you're attacking your superstar through the press. Now, old school days, 90s, even early 2000s, yeah, you would absolutely see that. Phil Jackson would not hold off entirely on ever criticizing Kobe Bryant or Shaquille O'Neal or whatever. Now, of course, you don't want some distraction of a spat or anything like that. But I think, I think Rick, whether he talked to someone, whether he actually watched the playback or not, I think he knew the whole time it was Luka that didn't collapse down. And again, whether that's just Luka missing or it got into kind of that gray area where Luka became fearful of completely leaving his man for a wide open three, I don't know. But the double team, first of all, should have come much earlier. If DeRozan's walking the ball up with 19 seconds left past half court, take it out of his hands immediately. He might get the ball back, but you, at the very least, take it out of his hands. Don't let him dribble around in a circle for 19 seconds and then get exactly the shot he wants to win the game. Take the ball out of his hands. You, you want to talk about the pick and roll with five seconds left? Or pick and pop, really? Not really a roll. He didn't roll to the basket. He flared out. Okay, you want to talk about that? Fine. Do it on the tra you know, trap there. Trap at the point of the screen. Or Luca, who goes to the elbow and just kind of hangs out in no man's land where he's not really guarding his man. He's not really close enough to actually help with the coming shot. Once you're down under three seconds left, that's what he's looking to do. Yes, there's still time to pass and even for that guy to dribble. I understand. But if you're in that situation, you have to crash down and force it out of his hands. I will take them any other spur. I will take any other spur jacking up a shot as time expires for two reasons. One, more than likely, if you're forcing a pass there, it's already a guy that's not as well made for that moment, for that kind of shot. But even if he makes it, that guy's probably doing a catch and shoot, which means you're going to have two plus seconds. Instead, you let DeRozan bleed the clock down to a half second, and then your inbound pass is garbage because your play you draw up, I understand, like, oh, you just got time for a catch and shoot. But if you're throwing the ball to Luka going away from the basket to nearly half court and he's shooting a one-footed fadeaway from half court, you're telling me that's the best thing you could draw up? No, no, no. That's a different conversation. I understand that. But the point is, half a second, and that's all you got out of it. All right, what would you get out of it if you had two seconds? Two and a half seconds. If Luka collapses down, forces the ball out of DeRozan's hands, and it goes to someone else who, yes, let's say they make a shot. Let's say they make a three. And now it's a three-point deficit, and it's 120 to 117. Okay? You play the odds, and the odds in that moment says... DeRozan is your biggest threat, the best shot maker in his sweet spot out there. Why do you take that? Why do you let him get exactly what he wants? And I think Tim McMahon actually had a great, great stat on this. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. No, I don't have it in front of me. So I'll edit that down. But the point is, you play the odds. You force the ball out of DeRozan's hands. If you don't do it with 19 seconds left, you damn sure do it with five or three. Just don't let him get that look. I will let anybody on the Spurs have anything, anything further out than a layup. 
before I will let DeRozan have that shot. And that's where we have to have a conversation here. Carlisle's going to say every time, it's me. And he might be, it looks pretty clear, like he's protecting his star player here from criticism. He's shielding him. All right, cool. I don't really care in that case. Yes, I think Luca. and I'll say this, I think Luca screwed up. I think it got into that gray area. I can't under, you know, I can't imagine if I were in his shoes in that moment, if I could say like, I wouldn't have made that mistake. I'm sure he was in a bit of a gray area where Luca had that momentary hesitation of like, oh, do I collapse down or am I leaving my guy wide open for a wide open look? And now I'm going to look like the jackass for abandoning my, uh, my responsibility on this end. His assignment. That's the phrase I was looking for. I, I can't imagine. But I think Luca made the mistake. And you can say, hey, hindsight's twenty twenty. Well, okay. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Luca himself would probably acknowledge, at least privately, yeah, I should have gone and crashed down. I should have forced the ball out of DeRozan's hands. If you do that, then maybe you have a different scenario because either the Spurs miss or you at the very least probably give yourself more time to do something, to respond. And maybe we're going to overtime. Or maybe they don't make the shot and you get a shot to win it in regulation. I don't know. Regardless, it's pretty key and pretty clear. They messed up. And there's just enough of these things mounting up now with Carlisle and how this team is coached and run, where I have to start questioning. And I think Rick is a good coach. And you look at how they've been doing in the last several weeks, you know, what they've won, 8 of 10? Some, I mean, I know they've had a couple losses now. Obviously, they lost the next night to the 76ers, so that's two straight losses. They're pretty much locking themselves in to the seven seed and they're going to be, or, you know, whatever, the play-in situation. And it's funny to me that you have quotes from Luca and uh, Mark Cuban now kind of complaining about the nature of the play-in tournament, like it's a bad thing. Here's, uh, this is from Tim McMahon. This is quoting Luka Doncic. He's looking at the play-in tournament for the Mavericks, and he says, quote, I don't understand the idea of the play-in tournament. You play 72 games to get in the playoffs, then maybe you lose two in a row and you're out of the playoffs. I don't see the point in that. Okay. And now, before I answer that, because my answer is the same to both of them, here, again, Tim McMahon getting the quote, quoting Mark Cuban on the idea of the plan. He says, and this is a reason why I have pretty high respect for Tim McMahon, rather than just saying what Cuban is saying, he gives you context that lets you know his thoughts on the matter ahead of time. And it's not like, a, oh, well, he's just pushing his opinion into the thing. No, no, no. He's giving proper context that basically says, I call bullshit ahead of time. Mark Cuban was part of the unanimous vote approving the NBA's play-in tournament. Quote, this is from Mark here, quote, but the compression of so many games into so few days make this an enormous mistake. You know, to both Mark and Luca, I would say, don't lose winnable games. Don't, don't do this load management crap where you don't play Porzingis against Philadelphia again the next night. Oh, well, it's a back-to-back. -back. We don't put KP in those scenarios. Okay, well, then don't bitch about being in the play-in tournament because you're, what, 2-2 two and two this year, 2-3 and three this year now without uh, Porzingis? in games he's missed more games than that there's more context to that but the point is when you have luca but you don't have kp it's very mix and match it, it's not the team is not putting everything out there they think they're playing this big picture big perspective where they're like ah well we're thinking about you know tomorrow in the playoffs Okay, well then all this freaking rest 
that you're giving these guys now, the games in which you've sat out Luka Doncic, the games which you've sat out Porzingis, the games which you've sat out Luka and Porzingis, you better damn well be able to show me in the postseason, not just the play-in tournament. If you lose in the play-in tournament, so help me. So help me. But if you get to the playoffs, get through the play-in tournament that you're pretty much... I I don't want to say guaranteed at this point because the Nuggets just suffered a massive blow with Murray's ACL tear. He's out for the year. That's going to very much, I think, even though we're towards, you know, a little bit of the later stretch here, that alters their projection. And that does keep things interesting in the West because the Nuggets are currently the four seed, but they've lost two straight. Remember, they won their first seven, I believe it was, with Aaron Gordon in the mix. They've now lost two straight, and they lost Murray, one of their biggest weapons. So you're taking him out of the mix, and you're looking at it, and you're saying, well, hey, the distance between you and them is four and a half games. Do they really fall that far? Probably not, but it does keep things interesting, at least for a shakeup in the standings. So if you're locked into this tournament, if you're locked into playing this, you better damn well get through it. But then you better actually be good in the playoffs. I don't want to see KP or Luka lagging behind in the postseason because it's like, no, 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 no. You told me that if we traded these like 12 or 15 freaking games in the regular season that they should be ready. Why aren't they ready? Now, to be clear, I think Luka, I think Luka's been largely phenomenal this year. And KP has been better as of late. And it's actually a shame this happened because this was a great game from Porzingis here. Uh, His recent tear he's on, his last three, 31 points, 15 rebounds, 57% uh, from two and 38% from three. Then the next game, 26 points, 17 rebounds, 50% from the field, 57% from three. And then 23 points, 12 rebounds, 53%, 50%. Uh, 53% from three. Yeah, that doesn't include this game that they just played. This does not include the Spurs game. So he only further built upon that as he went for 31 points, 15 rebounds, 12 of 21 from the field, three of eight from three, and a pair of blocks. I know that's the first time I've thrown blocks out there, but sue me. So the idea, KP, his last few games has been very good very good and you squandered it against san antonio now i know he fouls out with like a minute something left and that's you know that's a devastating development there but you gotta you gotta maximize this kp has been so up and down so inconsistent this year when he's right physically and mentally he is an all nba talent the problem is you don't get those consistently enough right now And whether we want to talk about that being a problem with Mark Cuban and the Mavericks approach, or whether we want to talk about it being a problem with KP somewhere in the physical or mental realm, fine. But the idea is you can't waste these performances. You can't. And that's what they allowed to happen by making a coaching blunder like this. Or if if the coaching assignment was correct in calling out what to do, but the player, this case being Luka, missed the assignment you can't have that and then for luca and cuban in the days you know thereafter to be complaining about the concept of the play in tournament you have no foot to stand on because you wouldn't have a damn word to say about it if your team wasn't in this situation you don't want to be in this situation don't wave the white flag so often by sitting out one or both of your stars don't do it Don't blow these winnable games when the Spurs aren't a bad team. To be clear, they're not a bad team. They are, however, inferior to what the Mavericks team is right now. You don't lose these games. You can't lose these games. And then have the audacity to complain about having to participate in a tournament that, again, especially for Cuban... You didn't have a damn word to say about it. You have, you voted with the owners unanimously to approve it. And now you're like, well, <laughs> my team's going to have to play in this? Well, you know, now I'm concerned about how many games and how many days we're talking about here. 
I don't know that this is good. This is a bad idea. Dude, that's just the state. That's just the state of things. You might say like, oh, well, in hindsight, I don't think this was the right call. But would you be saying that if your team wasn't in it? If right now the Mavericks were in the place of Denver, in the place of, here, let me give you another good example here. If the Mavericks were sitting in the five or six spot, the Lakers spot or the Trailblazers spot, would Mark Cuban still be complaining about this? Would Luca feel the need to comment on it? I don't think so. I don't think so. You don't want to be in that situation? Win. That's all you got to do. But there is enough weird stuff going on right now where I am a little shaken from my resolve in uh, the kind of trajectory of this team. I think they desperately need another, you know, creator. And we see different people going out and saying like, oh, well, NBA execs, anonymous sources say the Mavericks are going to go real aggressive this summer, pair someone with Luka. What year haven't we done that? I mean, really? We went balls to the wall for Kimber Walker. If it's not for Boston making the move they make that moves uh, Horford to OKC, Kimba Walker's in Dallas. Like, that much has been made clear. That's why Dallas thought for sure they had him. That's why you had some of these Maverick kind of insider guys like uh, Skin Wade talking about, like, yeah, you're going to be really happy because you're going to get a, a pretty big fish in Kimba Walker now. Kimba Walker hasn't been so great in Boston, especially this year. But that was the expectation. But then something unforeseen happened, and it changed the landscape. Did I say Horford getting moved from Boston? Horford was in Philadelphia at that point. Got moved to OKC. Whatever. Point being, an unforeseen shift happened that people didn't expect to happen, and it opened the door for Kimba to go where he went, which was not Dallas. Now you're hearing like, oh, well, the Mavericks are going to go out, and they're going to go uh, try to get like DeMar DeRozan. By the way, I think that would be a phenomenal addition. That's exactly the kind of player I want Dallas to pair. It doesn't have to be like a, give me a Victor Oladipo. I'm, I'm not sold on that idea. It doesn't have to be any of these other names either. DeRozan would be a fantastic ad. He's 31, 32, something like that. And in that range, in that uh, points per possession operating, like he hit the game winner last night, he's like the best in the league. You give him, you get him, Luka, and KP on a team, I feel really good. And I'll give up. I mean, it's, he's a free agent, and I think he's already even expressed that he's going to be leaving San Antonio. But I think you can do a lot with that, and that makes you a lot better. Even if it was a scenario where I had to do a trade, all right, fine, have Tim Hardaway Jr. Have, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys I would be willing to part with to get DeRozan on this team. But I don't know, man. We'll see what happens. I mean, it, it's funny to me that that's the narrative of like, oh, well, the League executives believe the Mavericks are going to go real aggressive to try and get something done this summer. What year have they not been aggressive? How many, how many years have we watched them go after some sort of big or at least medium fish and not close the deal? We're still talking about like Monte Ellis being the best free agent signing this franchise has had post-title. That's the territory we're in. He was great in Dallas for a year and a half. Then the Rondo trade happened. It fell apart. It fell the frick apart. And then he went to Indiana, and he was washed. That's what we're looking at. So the idea that, like, oh, breaking news, the Mavericks are going to go be aggressive in the summer. When are they not? It's a vicious cycle. I'm not playing into it until we get an actual commitment. And I don't even want a DeAndre Jordan scenario here. I don't even want a dude who's going to come in and say like, all right, I'm going to sign with the Mavericks. And then we relay it after the fact. And he's like, oh, actually, no, nah, no, I'm not. Until we have ink to paper, I am not buying into this. We should be able to get something. And we should be able to be excited about it. But until it happens, I've just been hurt too many times. Too many times. And that's how this team is watching them sometimes. Because you see 
how good they can be. You see how even in a game like the other night, the Spurs game, the Spurs were hitting most everything, it felt like, and the Mavericks couldn't do crap for three quarters. But just like the Milwaukee game before that, granted, without Giannis, you saw how the team could kind of mess around for three quarters, and then in the fourth quarter, as uh, Bob Sturm of the ticket puts it, basically go play like, all right, now I go win. That's what the better team does. Like, they can mess around for a while, and then eventually they're like, you know what? This has been fun, but uh, I'm going to play my game now called I Go Win. It looked like they were going to do that against the Spurs. You know, Luka ties it up, and it just didn't happen because of a blown assignment and because... I mean, really, it's the blown assignment, (laughs) but... I think there's a question as well, even in that. I think you should have trapped much earlier. And at that point, even if it is a blown assignment, I think you still have to look at Rick and say, like, dude, the F. Why Why are you even... You're playing with fire, and you're daring it to burn you. Why? Get it out of his hands at half court. Smother him. Get the ball out of his hands and have Finney Smith glued to him. They might get it back to him, but at the very least, make him work for it. Make him run around and cut and do all this crazy stuff just trying to get the ball back. Don't let him dribble the ball, square you up, take his time, and then go like, yeah, 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 I want want the screen over there. Okay, and a little crossover, okay. Luca coming? No? All right, step back. Game. Come on, man. Come on, man. And then you have the audacity to complain about the freaking play-in tournament. Unreal. Come on, guys. Anyway, I've ranted long enough. If you guys liked the video, don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below. If you want to see more, I know this wasn't like an in-depth film breakdown or anything like that. If you want to see me go more into that sort of thing, that's in the cards, but I need you guys to step in and help support what we're doing. If you want our community to, to see and discuss these things more in depth, then we got to kind of work together on this for it to happen because any revenue I do get from YouTube for usual content, I get nothing when I have to show film because I guarantee you I will get copyright claimed. A claim is not a strike. It doesn't hurt the channel. It just means I can't monetize that video. Or rather, if it is monetized, that the copyright holder will instead get the revenue from it. So it's an option, but if you want to see a lot of that stuff or more of it, you got to help me make it a thing because we got to keep growing and there's only one way to do that. Like the video, drop a comment, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. I've been Derek, you've been awesome, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. From Prospect to Legend.